Well, what are the things that you prayed for this past week? What are the things you went to the Lord in prayer for this, this past week? Hopefully you prayed for those people who are close to you, your family, close friends. Hopefully you prayed this past week that you would draw closer to God, that he would keep you from temptation. Hopefully you prayed that God would bring salvation to those who don't know him yet. And he probably pray, prayed for, for other things as well. The list of things we can come to God in prayer is endless. You know, we know a lot about prayer from God's word, from the, from the Bible. Paul tells us, to, uh, tells us when to pray. He says pray continuously. Jesus taught us how to pray. He gave us the example of the Lord's prayer. The Bible tells us why to pray because the Father uh, delights uh, uh, when his children come to him. He hears his children. But this morning I want us to look at a couple of short parables from Jesus that talk about, let's say, the heart of prayer. You know, our prayers always reveal what we believe. Our prayers always reveal what we believe, what we believe about God and what we believe about ourselves. Our prayers, let's say, reveal our hearts. So how should our hearts be? What should the posture of our hearts be when we pray to the Lord? Well, that's what we want to look at this morning. If you have a Bible, please turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be in Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. We'll have the text for you on the screen as well. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. Let's read that together. And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they always ought to pray and not to lose heart. So for a little context, at the end of the previous chapter, in chapter 17, Jesus began to teach his disciples about his return, his second coming. This is a time in the future when Jesus will come back in glory to judge the righteous and the unrighteous. And for a believer, this is when a time when our hope and Christ will be fully re rewarded. It's a day we look forward to, even though we can't predict when exactly it will happen. So Jesus told his disciples about his future return. But he also told them that between now and when he returns, it won't necessarily always be easy for them. That there will be hard times. And so in verse 1, we see he gives them this parable to encourage them to pray and to not give up, which is interesting to think about, right? Jesus knows how hard this life can be, and he doesn't want you to give up. It's so easy to give up sometimes, right? Maybe this morning you feel like giving up. Maybe you, this morning you're, the weight of life is, is, is crashing all around you. But I believe that God brought you here today on purpose, for a purpose, and that this parable is for you. So let's read it together. Chapter 18, verses 2 and 3. Jesus said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. So we meet this judge in the parable. And this judge doesn't really care what other people think. He doesn't care, it says, about what God thinks about him. He doesn't care what other people think about him. And just one verse, we can see this judge isn't very likable, right? He just cares about himself. But we also meet, in verse 3, this widow. Back then, widows, uh, women who had lost their husbands, were, were pretty defenseless. They didn't have a lot of resources. It was easy for people to take advantage of them. So some people might bribe the judge, but widows often didn't have enough money to, to bribe the, the judge. So instead, all she could do was bother the judge. We don't know her situation. We don't know who her enemy is or what exactly the, the problem is, but that doesn't, doesn't matter. She wants justice, and she's not getting it. So she keeps coming to this judge over and over to make her case. Verse 4, for a while the judge refused, but afterward he said to himself, 
Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. So the woman keeps coming to the judge and begs for mercy. Now, in an ideal world, this is the kind of person the judge would have mercy on, a a, a defenseless widow. She didn't have money for a lawyer, so she had to defend herself. The judge should have mercy on her, but in verse 4, we saw that he just refused at first. But this didn't stop the widow, right? She could have just said, well, I guess I lost. You know, I guess it's not going to happen. She could have just got tired and, and, and stopped asking, but she didn't. She kept asking. She kept coming back to the judge. She didn't take no for an answer. The judge says in verse 6 that the widow kept bothering her. And even though the judge didn't care what God thought, even though the judge didn't care what people thought, he finally gave the widow what she wanted so she would quit bothering him. Now, if we stop the story there, the easy conclusion would be that we, too, must simply bother God when our prayers aren't being answered. It seems like the conclusion that if God doesn't answer the first prayer, well, then we just come back with a second the third, again, and again, and again, until finally God's like, enough, I'm tired of you, Clint, fine, you can have that Mercedes, or whatever you're you're praying for. But is this how we should interpret this parable, that we should just bother and bother and bother and bother God until he gets tired of us? Well, thankfully, Jesus gives us an explanation for the parable. Look at verse 6. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on this earth? So Jesus here is making a contrast. We'll see this in the next parable too. Jesus is contrasting the unrighteous judge who only cared about himself with our loving father who is in heaven. So the judge had this, let's say, rare moment of mercy. It wasn't normal for the judge. But God, on the other hand, is always merciful. Our God loves us and delights when when we come to him in prayer. So this would be one of these how much more parables, right? So if a selfish, unrighteous judge will give mercy to a widow, how much more will God, who is righteous, give justice to his people? And the obvious answer is that, of course, God would hear the cries of his children and give them justice because he is a good God. You know, sometimes people apply this parable in the wrong way And they picture God as this judge. So they think of God as this judge who doesn't want to be bothered, that he has more important things to do than to be responding to your requests. And that, okay, we just need to bother God again and again, over and over. And if I bother him long enough, he'll get tired and give me what I ask for, just like in this parable. But I would say that's not the heart of this parable. The heart of the parable is that if a self is judge can be merciful. How much more will your loving father be merciful to his children that he loves? So let me be clear. You are never bothering God when you come to him in prayer. You don't have to make him tired or wear him out by asking for the same thing again and again. He's a good father. The Bible says he knows what you need before you ask him. Jesus gave us another example of this in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. Jesus, speaking about prayer, said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. To the one who knocks, it will be opened. But which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, 
how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Again, it's another how much more scripture. If someone asks you for bread, you won't give them a stone. If someone asks you for a fish, you won't give them a snake. So if that's true for you, how much more is that true of our Father in heaven? It's another contrast. So you don't have to bother God until he answers you, your prayer. He's a good father. He knows your heart. He knows what you need. And just because he doesn't answer your prayer in the moment you ask for it, that doesn't mean he doesn't care. That doesn't mean you have to just bother and bother and bother him until you make him tired and wear him down. So, you know, sometimes the answer to our prayer is yes. Sometimes the answer to our prayer is no. Sometimes the answer to our prayer is not now. Look at me again at verses 7 and 8 in, in chapter 18. Jesus says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I, I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So remember the, the context. In chapter 17, Jesus told his disciples there will be suffering, but that he is coming back to deliver his people. God will indeed give justice to his people. Though it may seem sometimes like the suffering is too much, that evil will prevail, that's not the end result. Justice will be served. Our prayers will be answered. When does Jesus say that will be? Well, at the end of verse 7, Jesus said, will God delay long over them? And then Jesus says, God will give them justice, how long? Speedily. Ultimately, God's people will be vindicated, and that will happen speedily. But as Jesus said in chapter 17, no one knows when Jesus is coming back except for God the Father. So certainly God's justice was not speedily <laughs> for his disciples because they died before Jesus come, came back. And for now, it has not come speedily for us either because Jesus still has not come back yet. From our human perspective, it's taken a while. It's taken a long time. But when we step back and think about the perspective of God in eternity, the time between Jesus' first and second comings will not seem like very much time. Second Peter 3 says, a day to the Lord is like a thousand years. And I think in our prayers, sometimes it can seem like God is not answering our prayers fast enough. But in the perspective of God, it's happening speedily. You know, it can be difficult to main that, maintain that perspective during hard times and during suffering. Which is why Jesus told them in verse 1, he was telling them this parable so they would keep praying. So that, that they wouldn't give up. So that they would not lose heart. In verse 8, Jesus said, when he does come back, will he find faith on earth when he returns? Well, we know from the Bible that the answer to Jesus' question is yes. But I think Jesus is encouraging his disciples. I think he's encouraging us to keep the faith going, to keep praying, to not lose heart, to not give up. Because justice one day will be coming. That the Lord does hear our prayers. That our hope in Christ will be rewarded. A couple of points of, of application from this parable. The first point is we should always pray. Jesus says this clearly in verse 1. We are to continually to come to God in prayer. This needs to be a habit in your life. It's going to look different for, for each one of you. Maybe some of you pray a lot in the mornings. Maybe some of you pray a lot in the evenings. Maybe some of you do both. Maybe you, some of you like to sit when you pray. Maybe some of you like to kneel. Maybe some of you like to walk while you pray. It's going to look different for all of us. The important thing is that you pray, that you spend time with God the Father, that you tell him what's going on in your heart, that you tell him what you are thankful for. You tell him about your problems. You tell him about your successes, that you pray for the people around you, your family, your friends, your co-workers, your church, to pray and ask for God to, to give you opportunities to share the gospel with us. 
the great news that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And yes, we do come to God and ask for things too, which leads me to my second point, and that is when we pray, we must trust that God is in control. Trust that God is in control. Control. When we pray and ask God for something, it can, and it's not happening, it can be easy to, to start thinking, oh, God isn't listening, or God isn't care, caring. And we can start to picture God like this judge, and we can start to lose heart. But these are not, are not true, right? We know from the Bible God is listening. We know from the Bible that God does care. He desires for us to come to him. I always like to give the, the illustration when talking about prayer that God is your father. God is not your grandfather, right? So when I was a kid, when I would spend time with my grandfather, he would let me do everything I wanted to do. So I'd say, Granddad, can I have some candy? Yes, here's some candy. Granddad, can I stay up late night and watch this film? Yeah, sure, go ahead. At my grandfather's house, I could usually get or do whatever I wanted. But that wasn't true in my father's house. Some of the things I asked for and wanted, I didn't always get. But it wasn't because my father didn't love me. It's because they did. It was because they knew what was ultimately best for me. I can look back now and see that it, it was good that they didn't always give me what I wanted. Now I can understand. When I was a kid, I couldn't. But now I can see they wanted what was best for me, and sometimes that meant not giving me what I wanted when I wanted it. My grandparents loved me too, but usually I was only with them for a weekend. So they could give me whatever I wanted, and I loved them for it. But I think sometimes we can come to God as if he is our grandfather, who will just give us everything that we want. But in the Bible, it says that God is our heavenly father. A good father does not always give his children whatever they want, whenever they want it. A good father does what's best for his children. So when we pray for things, even good things, we must remember that God is in control. I know this can sound basic or fundamental, but when you're going through hard times, when you're praying for something that isn't happening, this can be the hardest thing for us to remember. We must trust that God has a plan. Maybe his plan doesn't look exactly like your plan, but I guarantee you his plan is best. So we keep praying, we keep asking, we keep knocking, and even if God gives us a different result, we can trust that he is good and that he's in control. That's the first parable. Look with me at the second parable, verse 9 and 10. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So just like the last parable, Luke tells us at the beginning why Jesus told this parable. There were some in the audience who trusted in themselves to be righteous. So there were, we see that some that were listening to Jesus weren't trusting God to be righteous, but they trusted in, in themselves. In other words, there were people in the crowd who thought that God would view them favorably because of their spiritual performance, let's say. So on a scale, let's say of 1 to 10, with 1 being the worst, 10 being the best, Perhaps they would give their spiritual performance a 9 or, or maybe even a 10. They were confident, right? But not only that, they, it says that they treated people poorly who did not perform like them. So it wasn't bad enough that they trusted in themselves and thought that they were great, but they were also looking down on other people who weren't performing as highly as them. They were, let's say, snobby. They thought they were better than other people. So maybe they thought they were a 9 or a 10, and if they saw someone who was a 2 or a 3, they just looked down on them with contempt. So the parable starts, two men go to the temple to pray. Of course, prayer is a good thing. We're starting off on the right track. And in verse 10, we see it's, it's two men. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And of course, Jesus picked these two people because in society, they were complete opposites. 
The Pharisees were the most uh, influential religious teachers in Israel at the time. They were good at keeping the law from the Old Testament. So back then, if a Pharisee walked by, you would probably think, wow, this guy is, a, is important. He's so spiritual on a scale of 1 to 10. He's a 9. Maybe he's, he's even a 10. They were the religious leaders, and people looked up to them. So that was the Pharisee, but the other man was a tax collector. They were on the other end of the spectrum. They weren't very respected in society. They were known for being dishonest. Not many people liked them. So if you ask people back then to rate the tax collector's spirituality on a scale of 1 to 10, they might give him a 1. They might even give him a 0. So if you ask the people back then who is most likely to give a prayer that is pleasing to God, they would choose the Pharisee. We might choose the Pharisee. Because in the eyes of the people, he was the spiritual all-star. The temple was his home, his second home, let's say. But look at me at verse 11. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. So the Pharisee prays first, and he starts by comparing himself to other people, comparing himself to this tax collector. He thanks God that he doesn't steal money from people, that he's not like people who aren't just, that he's not like men who cheat on their wives, that he's not like this tax collector. Now, this wouldn't be bad if the Pharisee had said, thank you, God, that I'm not a murderer, that I'm not dishonest, that I'm not a cheater. That would be something we can be thankful for. The problem with this prayer is that while he's thanking God for this, he's also comparing himself to other people. It's always so tempting to compare ourselves with other people because comparing ourselves is one of the ways we can measure how we are doing. How do I know if I'm a good student? Well, I can look at my grades, but I can also look at my peers and see how they're doing. How do I know if I'm doing a good job at work? Well, I can ask my boss, but I can also look at my colleagues and see, do I earn more money than them or less? Do I have a higher position than them or less? Of course, comparing ourselves uh, isn't always bad. You know, I I like to play the guitar, but I can can watch uh, Rangel play the guitar over here, and he might do some lick, and I just know, wow, I can't do that. Praise God for, for Rangel and his gifts. So comparing ourselves to each other isn't always bad, but I think most of the time, it probably is. It probably is unhealthy. It can bring out envy inside of us. It can bring out pride and security. It can bring out unhealthy competition. And we see that here in verse 11, as he compares himself to this tax collector. And it's so easy for us to do too. We might Not just say it to God, but we might say it to our friends. We might say, hey, can you believe what so-and-so is doing? I would never do that, right? And pretty soon our comparisons turn into gossip and on and on. And deep down, what we're really saying is, I think I'm doing pretty good. Maybe I'm not a 10, but maybe I'm not a 9, but I'm at least an 8. But that other person... That person's a three, maybe he's a four. And as much as it's possible we try to resist the temptation to compare ourselves with each other spiritually, it can happen. But there's no room for that in the kingdom of God. There's no favoritism in the kingdom of God. There's no hierarchy in the people of God. The Bible says we are a royal priesthood. No one is better and no one is worse. And if you think you're better than someone else, if you're always looking down on other people, you need to repent of that sin and be done with it. Jesus can change your heart and give you a heart of compassion and empathy instead of a pride and contempt. Also, notice in verse 12, he doesn't credit God for helping him become the person that he is. Instead, he starts to give uh, details about his spiritual CV, his spiritual resume. What does he do? He he fasts twice a week. He gives tithes of all that he gets, which is pretty impressive. 
You know, when I was a boy, I would collect uh, sports cards. So I'd get these cards, and on the front would be their picture, and on the back it would have all of their statistics. So how many goals they scored, they scored, how many points they scored, how many assists. So if a person had good statistics, then you knew that he was a good player. A player that had no points, no assists, was probably a bad player. So you could just look at the card and know a player by their statistics. And this Pharisee had good statistics. He fasted more than was required. Back then, a fast was only required really once per year on the Day of Atonement, but this Pharisee fasts twice a week. Not only that, he gives 10% a tithe of all that he has. He's going above and beyond the law, I'd say. Now, we have to admit these are pretty good statistics. So that, mu- that must mean he must be pretty good spiritually, right? His prayer must be pleasing to God. But when we look at his prayer again, how much of his prayer is about God and how much of his prayer is about himself? A lot of it is about how great he thinks he is. He uses the pronoun I five times. This Pharisee is not lacking confidence. He thinks On a scale of 1 to 10, he's at least a 9, maybe a 10. So in theory, God should be impressed by him. This is the way our world works. The world rewards people who perform better than other people. If you perform well, you will be rewarded. And this world would definitely think that this Pharisee is impressive. But what about the tax collector? Let's look at his prayer. Verse 13, but the tax collector standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Again, just like the first parable, we have a huge contrast. First of all, it says that the, fair, the, the tax collector was standing far away. We don't know where the Pharisee was standing. Maybe he was standing in the inner parts of the temple while the tax collector stood outside. In other words, the Pharisee thought he was worthy to be in the presence of God, but the tax collector didn't think he was worthy. He stayed outside. The Pharisee was full of confidence, but the tax collector isn't so confident. He won't even lift his eyes up, the text says. He beats his breast and cries out to God. He says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's a short prayer, maybe six or seven words. He doesn't mention any of his statistics. We don't know how many times he fasts. Probably he's never fasted. We don't know how much money he's given to people. In fact, we know he's just been taking money from people. Instead of talking to God about the best things he has done, he confesses to God that he is a sinner. It's clear the tax collector doesn't think he's a 10 spiritually. Maybe he doesn't even think he's a 1. So who had the prayer that was more pleasing to God? The prayer from the guy who thought it was a 10 or the prayer from the guy who thinks he's a zero? Last verse, verse 14. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus' answer must have been a surprise to people. It wasn't the Pharisee he declared righteous. It wasn't the guy who thought he was a 10 spiritually. Rather, it was the tax collector's prayer that God heard and God answered. It wasn't the person with all the statistics. It wasn't the person who gave a lot of money, who fasted a lot. It was the person who was humble, who knew he was a sinner, who cast himself at the mercy of God. It was the broken person who knew that without God, he was nothing. And we see here that God's grace does not operate in the same system that our world does. In our world, you will be rewarded or punished based on your performance. And it's so easy to take that system of the world and bring it into our relationship with God. It's easy to think that we can try to impress God with our statistics. But Jesus here said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. 
My last reflection this morning when it comes to prayer is remember who you are and remember who God is when you pray. As I said earlier, our prayers reveal what we believe about God and our prayers reveal what we believe about ourselves. The Pharisee's posture of prayer was bad. He was exalting himself. The tax collector's posture of prayer was perfect. He humbled himself. He knew that his only hope was God. Let me ask you this morning, when it comes to your prayer life, how is your posture? How is your heart? Do you come to the Lord humbly with thanksgiving and in worship? Or do you come to the Lord with demands? Do you come to the Lord saying, look, God, I did all these great things for you, so now I need you to do something for me. We see here it doesn't work like that. God is not looking for spiritual nines or spiritual tens, let's say. No, God is interested in pure hearts like the tax collectors. The Bible says a broken and contrite spirit the Lord will not despise. So I encourage you as you pray this week, remember who God is. He's not the heartless, cruel judge who is tired of you bothering him. No, he's a good father. Every good and perfect gift comes from him, the father of lights. And if you're not seeing that prayer answered quite yet, don't give up. Don't lose heart. You know, maybe there's things or people in your life that you've been praying for for a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. You've prayed for years and years, and it seems like nothing is changing. Or maybe you've been praying for a certain situation to be resolved, and you're not seeing the result that you want. Let this morning be a fresh reminder, as it says here in chapter 18, to keep praying. Don't lose heart. Don't give up. You might not see the result that you want yet, but God will always give justice to his elect. God is not slow in keeping his promises, as some think of slowness, but he is patient to you, not desiring that everyone should come to repentance. I'm going to invite the worship team uh, up here to lead us in a song of response. I'll be down here in the front to, to pray with you. And we're going to have a time of invitation. It's a time when you can come forward, when we can uh, pray for you and, and encourage you. And maybe this morning you're new to this, uh, to Christianity. You're new to the Bible. You're new to, to Jesus. And I just want to encourage you from that last parable that no matter what you've done in the past, no matter what's going on in the present, that there is hope for you. That you can pray that prayer of the tax collector. God, have, merciful, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And God will heal that prayer. God will bring salvation to your heart. And you can be born again and live your life for Jesus Christ. So if the Holy Spirit is putting on that, putting that upon your heart this morning, we'd love to pray for you to tell you what it means to follow Jesus the hope and salvation found in him. Or maybe this morning you do believe, but you're just a bit weary from praying and praying and praying and not seeing that result that you hope for. I would love to just pray with you and encourage you. We need each other to remind each other, don't give up. Don't lose heart. God is faithful. God has a plan, and he is still in control. So let me pray for us, and then I'll be in the front here to pray for you. Father God, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your word, the opportunity to learn more about you and your heart and our hearts in prayer. Father, we thank you that you're not like this unrighteous judge who's, who gets tired of us and that we must just keep bothering you, but that you're a good father, that you care about us, that you hear us, that you know what we need even before we ask you. God, save us from the sin of this, this Pharisee. Save us from the sin of, of spiritual pride. Save us from thinking that we can do all these things in our own power to impress you. God, as we sang earlier, would you just remind us that we are broken vessels covered in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Help us to humble ourselves, 
understanding that you will exalt us. It's by your power. It's by your strength that we can navigate and walk through this life. We love you, God. We thank you that you hear us, that you are always with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll be up here in the front.